finally, let me begin the process by introducing our AARP moderator tonight. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Mary Alice Larson. Mary Alice will introduce the speaker and will lead the Q&A period, as I said. Mary Alice is a member of AARP's Iowa Executive Council. She's a retired nurse and a healthcare CEO. And healthcare CEO. She's moved back to Iowa from Alaska and now lives in Marshalltown, where she has actually quite a history. I was kind of really intrigued with the, the historical aspects here. Mary Alice began her nursing career at the Iowa Veterans Home in Marshalltown. She was later granted a sabbatical to attend the University of Iowa College of Nursing. After completing a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing and a Master's Degree in Mental Health Nursing, she returned to the Iowa Veterans Home and established the first 40-bed mental health unit at that facility. I think that's quite an undertaking, frankly. Um, later, Mary Alice moved to hold a variety of leadership and management and consulting positions in other healthcare organizations. She has continued to maintain an interest and commitment to quality aging. Her most important role, however, and I think this is one of the things that really qualifies her for tonight, truthfully, is being an advocate for her 94-year-old mom. So she has first-hand experience in what it means to support a parent. Um, and I, I think there are probably some of us in this room that only know too well what, how tough that can be at times. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our AARP moderator, Mary Alice Larson, to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I know you will be very gratified with what you're going to hear this evening. Joel Ola, Executive Director of Aging Resources of Central Iowa, celebrates over 40 years of professional service in aging and health care administration. He has been serving Aging Resources as its executive director since March of 1995. In 2005, Aging Resources was awarded Best Place to Work in Central Iowa by the Des Moines Business Record. Joel holds a master's degree, specialist in aging, and a doctorate in educational gerontology from the University of Michigan and its Institute of Gerontology. Joel is a licensed nursing home administrator. He is a frequent lecturer on public policy and aging, home and community-based elder care, and mental health and aging for universities, medical schools, and health centers. Joel was contributing editorial writer for the resource 50 Plus Lifestyles, Aging in Iowa, and Generations from 1995 to 2009. He received the Outstanding Professional in Aging Award from the Older Iowans Legislature and a Distinguished Alumni Award from the College of Arts and Sciences Western Michigan University in 2005. The title of Joel's presentation is Supporting Our Parents from Conversation to Action. One of the perks of being the moderator is that I was sent the slides last week and I got to spend a lot of time looking over those slides. And I understand you all got a handout but you probably didn't get a chance to look at them thoroughly. You are really in for a treat in the form of valuable and useful information. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joel Ola to the podium. I'm glad to see everybody here. Sorry for the parking problem this evening because even I had got the last spot, I think it's six o'clock. And I had all that material to bring with me. So um, please note that this is going to help you through. It was designed um, so that you could read it, 
There's only two slides per page. It's on the very finest setting in the copier. And it's in color and it's got really fancy paper. So we put a lot of effort into that. And this is gonna help you because rather than have you write and scribble all night long, I would rather have you listen and think about some of the things that we're gonna be talking about. If you wanna take notes, there's plenty of stuff on the back. And my advice is to just take the slide numbers, you know, one through 67, and just make that your marker and put that in as your question or your comment. It makes it a lot easier. So hopefully that will work. So everybody has a copy, hopefully, and, and then we can just sort of talk together on some of the things you'll see. Um, and it's conversation to action. That's the other part of the, the supporting our parents because not only parents, this is much wider than this. This is about family caregiving, no matter what generation. And we'll talk about that as we're moving along tonight. Uh, there are four sections of this particular program, and the goal here is to give you good, practical information and tools that you can use. That's the goal. So the last section in the presentation gives you all sorts of information, websites, you know, tools that you can use to maneuver yourself through the caring process. So don't worry, it's all at the end. And it's structured so that it fits within the context of the presentations that are in this series. We're going to be talking about advanced directives, but not in great detail. There's an attorney who will talk about the great detail in the next and coming weeks. We're going to talk about caregiving in general, mostly family caregiving. Next session, we'll be talking about Alzheimer's specialty and other care like that. So again, we're going to set the stage, we're going to tee it up, and then let's play the game. That's kind of like how this session will go. So relax, enjoy, not too much, don't want you to fall asleep, but uh, by the same token, um, this is kind of very good information, I think, that I want to put into your hands. It's the latest stuff that we have, and I hope that it is going to be informative as well as enjoyable. So we're going to talk about the big picture first. We're going to talk about that big picture, the dynamics of population. How does it fit? And we're going to make a case for caregiving in general, how it looks, what are the dynamics in that. Then we're going to talk about the family situation. Uh, it might be a dialogue between you and a parent or some other family member. And lastly, those are the resources. So that's the structure of what we're going to be talking about this evening. And Rosalind Carter said it very well, no matter who you are, you're going to be involved in caregiving at some point in your life. You're either going to receive it or give it or know about it. And of course, you know, Rosalind herself is dealing directly right now with caregiving issues with Jimmy as he struggles with the brain cancer issue that has returned. A very wise woman. Now, family caregiving in our society is an extraordinary, an extraordinary gift because the value of this in terms of just dollars and cents matches almost the output of Walmart. One of my least favorite things. But needless to say, it, you know, over $470 billion, that's the cost factor for family caregiving. It is extraordinary. And we're talking about over 40 million people that are delivering that caregiving every day, sometimes 24-7 if we're talking about an Alzheimer's person. Um, I think one of the things we should be aware of is how our population is moving ahead. And these uh, diagrams here kind of give you a visual of how our population was structured and how it's moving differently today. You'll notice on the uh, slide to the right here, um, the, you're beginning to see the boomers coming on board. You remember those people born between 1946 and 1964. That's how we bracket the boomers. And as this population moves through that spectrum, there will be many changes. And, I, and you can see that as it moves up. Now, in demographic terms, this is called the pig in the python because the python is able to unhinge its jaws and swallow something whole. And you can see here how the boomers are traveling through and how it changes the demographic structure. 
And how important that is when we look at the numbers, because those numbers are going to be the caregiving process and how it's going to be stressed or strained in terms of just raw numbers of people to help this population as it moves through. One of the very, you're going to see this slide twice because I think it's so critically important. And we're talking about the caregiver support ratio. You'll notice here that if you can see that up there, we're talking, that's the boomers as they're going through their life cycle. And you can look at the numbers on the left hand side. So we're talking right now that in terms of the ratio of caregiver to patient or caregiver to person, it's about seven to one and it's declining because there's just not enough people behind us in order to fill that gap. And so the critical point here is that as we're going through the most um, needy time, and that those are people in their 80s and better, for healthcare delivery and caregiving, the number of people to back us up is going down. That's what's important to see in this particular slide. This is not just here in our country, but it's worldwide. As a matter of fact, it's more exaggerated in developing nations than it is here in our country. It's something to think about. So this is global, not just here in our country. It's, some call it the silver tsunami. Nonetheless, it's something to be aware of, not just something to be afraid of, but just know that that's a dynamic of our life as we're moving through, okay? Most important one is here. It's the 85 and over group because that is accelerated in its growth and that holds, of course, the key to all of those things about caregiving that we're going to talk about. And another picture is chronic disease. Remember today, that's what takes us down is chronic disease, not the infectious diseases of the past because we've conquered some of those things, at least in our country. And the thing we need to work on is pain and disability. But as we'll see as we're going through that, it's something that we can work on. It's not an inevitable. It's something that can be worked with. So we know that most people have a chronic disease or two as they move through their life cycle. And you can see the various processes of chronic disease and you can see ones that are in prevalence, uh, starting with heart disease and going down to cancer. You notice where Alzheimer's is here. Uh, that's moving up. You'll hear about that on, on our next session, but know that it's there. This is self-reported chronic disease, and that's why you don't see Alzheimer's there as you do in the others. But you can see the various forms of chronic disease, and it affects well over half of the population as it ages in place, starting at 65 when this graph was made. Here is what I was talking about earlier, that even though we might have chronic disease, we do have means to control that, and that is exercise, diet, uh, physical activity, uh, watching our smoking and drinking habits, all of that stuff. You know, it's rather strange, isn't it, that there is something that we can do about it, and yet we fall into it. We want a pill that can transform it rather than work at it. And this is kind of a mindset thing that we need to kind of overcome, that this chronic disease process doesn't have to be painful and limiting if we change our lifestyle. Bob Bender talked about that in our last session, that we do have control here. That's something to think about. Now, let's get into the second section here, and this is talking more about the differences in generations and how people respond and we can say that a lot of people want to stay home and be cared for at home and grow and develop at home. But the issue, of course, is that it's a different generation. They're not as compliant. What does that mean? It's a challenge for the caregiver if they're going to fight you. See, the boomers are not exactly easy people. We're not. We tend to be smart asses sometimes. We know better. And that makes it very challenging for caregivers when you have that attitude that we've read that, I went online, I know that's right. Wow, that's a change. Because the traditional, the great generation, when they looked at that white coat, it was yes doctor and no doctor. Huh. 
Not today. And you can expect that to change as well. Now, this is a representation of all the different generations that are out there and how they're categorized by the social scientists. Why is it important? Well, it's important to know a little bit about the, the traits and general characteristics of this generation. Do you know who put this together? Manpower, the largest employment agency in the world, because they know how important this is in the workplace and how the different generations interact with one another, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively. But in order to understand that, is to understand the working dynamic and making people, you know, working together to accomplish the goal. So that's kind of like why they did this. So what we'll present is just kind of ideas about, just general characteristics. They, they don't necessarily define you, but they characterize you, okay? And the great generation, boy, boy, look at that. You know, we're talking about the generation going through the Great Depression, the Second World War, you know, those kinds of values, saving rather than spending. Um, you know, they value hard work, they, they like that personal touch. Those are the kinds of things that characterize th this great generation. Uh, the boomers, however, are a little bit different. They are not the savers, they are the spenders. And that they've grown up with television and all these wonderful things that just mushroomed after the Second World War because they were times of prosperity. And they, are a little different in terms of how they respond to people and interact. So something to keep in mind as we're walking through this big mushroom of a generation. And I'm part of that. It's a very, almost at the beginning of it. So I can understand it, I think. All right, let's go into the Generation X. Now, a little bit different too. Um, they are a little more like the traditional generation in their spending habits, a little more conservative. Uh, they've grown up with more electronic communication and uh, that they're very, very comfortable with that. They're um, a little indifferent to authority. They don't kind of respect it in the manner in which the great generation does. So it's something for us to work with as they go through their lifestyle. And again, these are general characteristics, but I think it's something that does have value in, in order to understand that process. And the millennials, uh, they're, they're the generation most likely to be the caregivers for the boomers as they hit the 80s and so forth. So it's something to look at. They're very, very technically savvy. They are, you know, I find them refreshing. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sensing, because I'm a kid of the 60s, I'm sensing a very kindred spirit there. They're kind of looking at doing good. Wow, that's exciting to me. Um, anyway, uh, again, a different generation. Uh, there's different ways that they approach life, different ways to communicate, to be effective with them, and so forth. Something to consider. The last one that's out there, they really haven't termed the generation Z yet. They're, they're most likely they're gonna be called the iGens or the Digitarians because they're so into technology that I worry that they are not gonna be able to communicate on a personal level. So that's something of a challenge that we're gonna to have to work with this generation as they go through too. But I think the bottom line, no matter what generation we're talking about, no matter what pattern of communication we're talking about, Aretha Franklin said it well, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. If we remember that very, very basic principle that we can see that that will work no matter what generation we're talking about. So, was that helpful, entertaining, interesting? I salute manpower for its work. Um, one of the things that's changed a lot because you know, there was a time in our country when we didn't have Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. You look at 1935 for Social Security, first benefits coming out in 1937, and they were very gradual. It didn't hit all of a sudden. There are a lot of groups that were not in that. Medicare and Medicaid, the Older Americans Act programs, 1965, Great Society and so forth. So those are the programs that are still operative. But there was a time when they weren't there. And so what happened, for caregiving and so forth took place on the family farm normally, and it usually was 
either the eldest daughter or the daughter of the oldest son who took care of that particular parent until they died, and that was the transfer of wealth from one generation to another. So today we have other programs that support. We don't have poor farms anymore, uh, but we have programs that sustain a person in their home, uh, and that's how we do it. We have um, a less acute illness and more chronic illness, so it's just a change uh, in our society. Today, the average caregiver is a 49-year-old female who is engaged in the workforce and has dependents or children. That's the average caregiver. In the 1960s, for those of you who remember Leave it to Beaver, and, and mom was always dressed up in a dress and she had high heels on and she was home all day, took care of whatever, uh, only 40% of the uh, workforce was uh, female at the time and today it's well over 60%. So it's a different, different situation today than it was back even in the early 60s. And uh, women are the primary caregivers in terms of the numbers and percents. So we're talking over 60%. Um, and the typical caregiver age range now is between 45 and 49, but that's the average if you take a snapshot. So there's also been a shift from rural to urban America, which of course isolates generations and you find that the people that are left in the rural areas are more likely to be uh, the older generation rather than the younger generation. Now another very important factor is the complexity of health care. Mary Alice and I were talking about how care has changed so much. The care that's being given today in the home 10 to 15 years ago, it used to be called skilled nursing care. But today it's being done by people in the family, whether that be IVs or ostomy or whatever it is, they're doing that care in the home for a different generation. But the important thing is, um, on the right-hand side of that slide, it says that over 60% of them learned it as they were moving along. They weren't given the expertise that they probably should have had, so they're sort of learning as they're going along. Wow, that says something there, I think. What, it, what should be the case, of course, is we should have that expertise before they are sent home, and people should be kind of comfortable with that. But that's not the way it's happening today. This is what we're talking here about two fetus injection. All that stuff is part of the care that is being delivered in the home for a, another generation. <coughs> Think about that for a minute. So when we said 40 million people, over 40 million people are family caregivers, we're talking about 34 to 35 million that are taking care of people that are older. And those 10, or to 20, uh, 10 to 12 million people are taking care of people 50 and under, especially those with special needs children. So again, something that total picture of care. Uh, roughly 75% of family caregiving lasts about five years, and the rest, 25% are more than five years. Um, you can see here that the family caregiver provides about 25 hours per week, and if it's, an, if it's a spouse, it's much more like 45 hours per week. Think about the time commitment, think about the lifestyle, disruptions, and so forth. All of that part and parcel of caregiving that we have today. There's a dynamic in care, and I, I, I want you to see this as not necessarily seven solid things that don't move. There's a, a great deal of dynamic here in terms of care. So one begins caregiving, in a sense, kind of casually taking care of the groceries, doing certain tasks around the house. And then it soon develops into something much more involved and complicated. And again, you're kind of invading somebody's space, so there's some give and take here that you, you should see as people progress in caregiving. And so as more is demanded of you that you're gonna to have to make an investment you'll reach a point where you will have to bring in professional assistance to assist your efforts. And again, that's gonna cause some difficulties in family dynamics because some people just don't want anybody other than family messing in the house. 
it's very frustrating for caregivers in the family to deal with this. So know that this is a very dynamic, fluid situation as you move from less intense care to more intense care to more formalized care to institutional care. So that's what these steps kind of have in them as you approach that avenue. A lot of um, times there's almost a, a knee-jerk response that some of the medical providers have when they have a patient come in with their family members. They say, well, you should talk about assisted living. Almost before they've even talked about in-home care or talked to the person about what they would want. And remember that the medical community isn't exactly as knowledgeable as one would hope they are in terms of geriatric care. It's not taught very well, sometimes not much at all. And so they're not aware of the other various avenues and approaches in the community. And so when we talk about assisted living, it might not be the most appropriate, and certainly it might be one of the most expensive routes that some family members um, cannot afford. So again, knowledge here is important as a caregiver. That's why we're kind of spending a little time talking about some of the options which we'll talk about as we move through. Here's uh, again that same ratio of caregiver to person. And I think, it's, again, it's a, s a very critically important thing to consider as, when, as we're walking through this process that in the times that we're going to need it the most, the caregivers may not be as abundant as we think they are. All right. Also, and I'm just going to have one slide on this, these are the paid caregivers. These are the professional or whatever caregivers. And so know that there are over 4 million uh, paid caregivers. They are our nursing, uh, nursing home health aides, their nursing assistants, personal care aides, and all that stuff. Uh, rock solid. And again, we have difficulty finding people to fill these roles. And maybe the reason why we find it difficult is because we don't value them. There are, the slide there, the material that you see falling down here, we can put it in the negative too, that if we're not providing a living wage, we're not providing enough benefits, we're not providing opportunities for advancement, we're not having mentoring going on, we're not having people that provide guidance and care with these people as they're creating a career path and a profession. That's why it's hard to find people to fill these roles. And it will be increasingly difficult to do that unless we use the positive and to value these individuals more than we value people who work in fast food, for example. So if we're serious about fulfilling this gap in our care delivery system, we have to be serious about treating these individuals with the professional respect that they deserve. If we don't, that care ratio is going to go well below what you saw in the previous slide. And let me make a suggestion. For those people who like to condemn some of the immigrants that are flowing back and forth, I ask you this question. Would you like to be cared for by someone that comes from a culture that values aging and respects it or not? Think about some of the cultures that these individuals come from and how they treat older individuals in their society. So just something to think about as we hear people talking about doing some things to keep them away. Okay. All right, now when we talk about the hours of care, the strain and so forth, and we're talking about people who are giving care that are involved in the workforce. So there are stresses and strains here as well, so that we're over, well, about 50% of the hourly and 33% of the salaried individuals that are out there providing care are not given the flexibility that they should have to manage both the work and the caregiving, and it creates huge strains on people. Certainly we do have the Family and Medical Leave Act, but that doesn't help those people who need to work. It leaves a gap. And there are very few pilot programs out there today 
that, in a sense, work with people that are providing care and support them in the working environment. So that when you have people that are performing some very complicated and involved things and are also expected to be performing well on the job, sometimes there's a disconnect. And people wind up quitting their job or taking an early retirement or whatever in order to manage the caregiving that takes place. An important statistic here that 60% of the caregivers were employed. They were also doing some caregiving. The higher hour caregivers, that is the ones who are providing support to their spouses, remember that difference between a family member and a spouse in terms of the number of hours required, that as a result of their caregiving, that all of these things in the workplace happened. There are some kind of hopes out there in terms of <coughs> technology that may help us manage. Some of these things you're, you're certainly aware of, but maybe not applied to uh, caregiving. They're improving the monitoring devices in the home in all sorts of ways, you know, between turning off a stove if it's on too long or having a software program built into the television to kind of measure a person's intellectual capacity and so forth. But a lot of these programs, these monitoring devices, are extremely expensive. And so we're hoping that that will drop a little bit so that these things can be utilized more effectively and more generally in the home. Uh, medication management devices have been out there for a while, but the current ones are much better. Uh, they're more engaging than the ones of the past, so we can expect those things to improve. Uh, and how many have been noticing the grocery stores? They're providing online shopping assistance. Just today, I believe, Kroger uh, said that they were gonna do this on a national level and that they were gonna have this uh, so that you could order online and pick up your groceries at any point in time as opposed to dealing with it. But they applied it to the working uh, family and uh, the mom with all the kids. Well, we would like to apply this to uh, the caregiver and the older individual in the home. So. Uh, hy V does that now, so we can, we can expect that service to increase if we look at it. Uber uh, certainly uh, is providing transportation that um, was not there before. Uh, we will forget about what happened in Kalamazoo temporarily. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that is an important development too in terms of getting people around because transportation is a significant area of need. Uh, there's all sorts of new services that are coming online in terms of home maintenance for people that need that and of course, Online healthcare, whether we talk about telemed or whatever, those things will be coming on board, hopefully helping family members who are caring for uh, people to understand the dynamic of their care and to do a better job of that care. Uh, there's the CARE Act, which is, a, is an act to, in a sense, enhance the work of the caregiver in the family and make them part of that medical team, work them in. Um, right now in our legislature, unfortunately, it didn't make funnel this time, but hopefully uh, before session is over, we can probably do something like that again. Uh, this map shows you what states have adopted the CARE Act, those that are thinking about doing it, and those that are, are still sleeping. So know that, that it's a growing trend and something that we need to work on because we need to enhance that uh, caregiver inside of the communication medically between that patient's care in a medical setting and that care delivered in the home setting, okay? Here's an interesting finding. Uh, over 80% of physicians are not adequately prepared uh, to treat individuals with Alzheimer's or, or dementia and that about 25% of them are not very sophisticated in handling multiple chronic diseases. This is something that we need to improve in our medical education in order for uh, those physicians to be a little more expert in that area. And one thing we have to protect, of course, is against is caregiver burnout. Very important. Because the better the quality of the caregiver, the better the quality of care. And of course, depression is linked very closely with caregiving at all levels. Okay, one of the things that has not been done yet is we haven't taken a careful look at caregiving generally, nationally. 
And these questions are questions that have yet to be answered significantly enough. Who assesses the caregiver? It just happens. Uh, how are they doing? How are they managing these skilled nursing tasks? Good, bad, indifferent? Are they able to continue to provide care? When I talk to medical students, I often say, are you looking at the caregiver behind the patient? Are you looking at the changes that you see in that person? Because they're part of the process too. And if you see something, you need to kind of intervene here to ask them at least how they're doing and can they manage. And are they aware of, are they skilled enough to handle the balance of the care plan? Okay, okay. this is a cute little cartoon about, um, in a sense, let's read the slide that says, uh, they sat me down and said, Pops, we need to talk about aging in place. And I said, aging in place of what? <laughs> See, there's a little gap there in terms of what we're talking about. I thought that was clever. An interesting uh, perspective. And this comes from our caregiver specialists that deal with this all the time. And read this through. It says, parents may base their decisions in healthcare on independence and comfort, where the adult children may be more concerned about the parents' health and safety. Remember that slide in the beginning about aging in place of what? Kind of addresses that. It's just a difference in how you look at it. And you can see that if they're not on the same frequency, how it's going to be a little bit difficult for them to be managed. <laughs> and think about what we said about differences in generation. If you think this generation, the great generation, is going to be tough to manage, just wait. The fun is about to begin. So, in terms of resources, AAAP has, has some great resources and their caregiving uh, center recommends when you kind of get into this caregiving thing to kind of have a conversation about what you would want to happen well in advance of the crisis that might happen. And so to take advantage of those times in life where we're going to think about that. So the adult child, in a sense, talking to the parents about what would you like? How would you like to see this go? Uh, you know, there are a number of advanced directives. You know, there's the wills. There's all of that stuff. But it also says, what would you like to happen? How would you like this to go? So does it take a health crisis? Does it take an intervention? Does it take somebody else's family? To start the conversation, the important thing is that the conversation should be started as soon as possible so that everybody's kind of on board. All right, and of course here again, R-E-S-P-E-C-T is very important when one is communicating uh, across the board. Don't treat people like children, they're not. Um, AARP provides a couple of devices here and that's, you know, you can map it out what needs to be done, either simply like this or something that's more complex like that in terms of the detail. But something to think about, something to say, you know, um, let's deal with this in a systematic manner, let's work this thing together, all of that stuff. Again, you'll find that material um, when we get to the end part, when we talk about resources, it's there. I just want to show you what it kind of looks like. And caregiving can take a variety of forms. Um, sometimes you're a long distance caregiver. Be prepared for guilt trips. Be prepared when you have maybe a, an onboard person in the area that's taking care of mom or dad and this person that's over here in California. And the person over here in California is getting kind of anxious and they come home and they sell, tell the person who's been taking care of the person you're not doing a good job I can see that. And then the, the fireworks start. 
long distance caregiving has that disadvantage. No, no, that's there. The spousal caregiver, we talked about much more involved, many more hours, and it's intense. You know, I always say the retirement marriage, you know, the 24-7, you know, for better, for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> Think about that, that interruption in, in that lifestyle and schedule. The working caregiver, you know, we talked about the average caregiver being a 49-year-old female in the workforce with dependents. That dynamic there of the workforce works against caregiving a bit. And then the sandwich generation, which we have today, you know, you're taking care of kids and you're taking care of parents at the same time. I can't tell you how many times people come into the agency that look like deer in headlights. They had no idea, no idea that they'd be giving care to their parents at the same time they'd be providing care to their kids. And they don't know what the hell to do. That's why they're there. They come to see us. Thank God they're coming to see us because we can help them. But how many are struggling without that help and are frustrated? They're trying to do their best and it's just not working out very well. It's important for the caregiver sometimes to take a break, to get away. That's what respite's all about. And sometimes you know something, it's okay to say no. Think about it when you were raising children. You said no a couple of times. So it might be okay too to do that, especially when you're under tremendous strain. This is a, uh, a great resource under the agingcare.com and I, I have included some of that material at the end, but I just opened the contents here and, and hopefully you can read it in your PowerPoint there that these are some very key points They've organized it very, very well. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you can, look at that to, to review that resource because it can, it can save you some hassle and some frustration. I thought this was interesting. This comes from uh, that same resource. Look over here in the blue. And this is when, these are flags. When you think somebody needs some help. If you look at the categories, the physical things, things start to change a little bit. The home environment, things aren't quite what they were. Um, the emotional overlays that are kind of unusual, out of character. Some of the cognitive things that are going on and a variety of other issues. These are kind of flags that I think are important to know about and they're helpful for the caregiver to recognize. Nicely organized here. This gets into a little bit of the advanced directives, but in a kind of a positive way. And let's just kind of read through from top to bottom so that hopefully you can see it on your copy. These are the five wishes. And I think they're, they're kind of simple, but you know, they're, they're very impactful when you, when you hear them. The person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't, you can fill in the blank. The kind of medical treatment I want, but most importantly, what I don't want how comfortable I want to be in my health care, uh, how I want people to treat me, and lastly, what I want my loved ones to know. It's a whole package here called Five Wishes, and um, some of the stuff was developed here at Drake. But anyway, some of it is uh, now, it's all online, and if it, you don't have it online, we can get it to you in, in hard copy. And of course, the dynamic when you get into the caregiving stuff and when you take the steps to provide the care, you know something, it ain't gonna go so well a lot of times. It's going to be very difficult. How to express this? You're dealing with adults, not children, and they're, they're adult people and they know what they want. And so it's gonna be sometimes very difficult to bridge that and say, you know, there's something that needs to be helped here, but I'm, I'm going to listen to you, but I think you kind of need some help. And that process of articulating and the dialogue and the communication is the foundation of good caregiving. That respect must be there, and you must listen to one another, otherwise it's going to be 
difficult. <clears throat> so, respecting, letting people contribute, I think is a, is a procedure that we recommend because it tends to produce some very good quality results. It's so easy to give advice. <laughs> Especially when you're the one that's giving the advice and somebody else has to take it. Remember when we said the generations are changing a bit? And if you think it's difficult today, just wait. Oh, those millennials will be sainted as we progress and need the care. Something to think about. Again, just communicate, respect, all that stuff is very, very important. All right, let's go into the final section, and these are the tools that are out there that I would encourage you to look at, and then as you're looking it over and you're going through this program, uh, some of these things will be, uh, make more sense as we go through. This looks crazy, this slide has got a lot of stuff on there, but let's say that there is a system out there under the Older Americans Act. You've all heard about Meals on Wheels, right? I hope you have. And that's part of this whole initiative that started in 1965, at least officially. Does anybody know how Meals on Wheels started? During the Second World War, when London was bombed, people lived in those tunnels. Meals were delivered to the tunnels so that people survived. That's where Meals on Wheels originated. And so we're, we're having an adaptation of that here in our country by delivering the meals to the local community. Um, in addition to the meals, there's a whole set of services that are out there and, and a whole set of services that are there for caregivers. And you can see just how, how large a picture that is. Uh, the area agencies in this case, because I'm a director of one of those 629, we have six in our state uh, that provide that service. And I'll, we'll explain what those services are. There's the six. Okay. And you can see there are websites and so forth, numbers, and we'll get into that too as we go along. And most of that stuff is free, believe it or not, because we paid for it through our tax dollars. I would encourage you to at least look at the elder care locator. This is so critical for especially the long distance caregiver because no matter where you are in the country, they can flag the, geogra the geographic area where your person that you're caring for or a long distance caregiving, you can circle the services in that community. I, can, I remember one Saturday I was at the office and I, I got a contact from Hawaii because the daughter was living in Hawaii and the mom was in Ames. And the daughter wanted to know what services were available in Ames because she couldn't be there because she was living in Hawaii. So we were able to match up the services to where her mom was in Ames and to let her work through that system and get those services delivered to mom. That's how this service works. Uh, there's an actual real person um, on there Monday through Friday in those hours. It's a website, it's a phone number, and here are all the services that are available no matter where you are in the country. Uh, this is our agency's offering of services very parallel to what you saw in that slide before it. That we do have, there is a National Family Caregiver Program, and it's a program that's been out there for 20 years. And uh, Kay Bonnings, who you see there, is our specialist. I would, anybody would uh, benefit from Kay's long experience too in that area. And those are the kinds of services that are available in the Family Caregiver Program. This is part of the Lifelong Links. It's a one-stop shop kind of thing where uh, not only aging services, but services for disabled adults and people over the age of 18 um, are available to you. Uh, this is what the website looks like. As you work through it, it's kind of interactive. And here are some of the assistances that are available for caregivers using that particular website. Another great piece of information, another locally produced document is the gift of peace of mind, and that does hit the advanced directives again. 
You can look at the content, a new thing called uh, the physician orders for life-sustaining treatment for those cases, maybe more extreme care. That's something brand new. Another guide uh, for families uh, that are approaching caregiving, courtesy of AERP. You can see the content of that website at the base here. Information in your hands. A brand new perspective on caregiving just out for generations. A great resource for you. Uh, another home alone resource that the ARP has. Again, you can see the, uh, the website. That's how you get that information. We live in an amazing age, don't we? You know, before you, you would just spend hours and hours and hours somewhere other than your home and you don't have the time now, you can just click and have it printed off right there in front of you. What an amazing age we live in. Uh, the Family Caregiver Alliance, another national group that has tremendous resources for caregivers. And now a series of resources, and here are the websites and so forth, and it tells you what's inside of those resources. And uh, this one here on the Administration on Aging, uh, it'll click and it'll turn over to the Administration for Community Living. That's what it's called these days, but AOA, Administration on Aging, still is valid, and, and it will make that connection for you, so don't worry about that when you click on it and it switches you. Another set of resources for caregivers, and so on. And I did it. So, thanks.